All right, well, welcome to part one of our GAP lectures. As I've mentioned before, in eighth grade, you were supposed to have covered the founding of the nation all the way up through Reconstruction, um, but I feel like I would be remiss if I didn't cover the at least the Civil War and Reconstruction, but definitely westward expansion, as we're going to cover in this lecture. Um, you at least need to remember this stuff. It's it's pretty critical um, to our identity as a nation. It's also pretty critical to our uh, philosophy about uh, power, our philosophy about um, kind of our our God-given right, as we describe it throughout history, our manifest destiny to control this land. So we're going to dive in. Um, this first part is going to cover uh, the year 1789 to 1860. And the way we're going to do that, there's no easy way to do it. Um, the, but the way we're going to do it today is we're going to look at the presidencies that come in those years, um, highlight a few of the major accomplishments, and again, with our eye toward uh, westward expansion and our eye toward um, the coming civil war. So with that, we're going to dive in. We're going to look at our first three presidents, okay? Uh, Washington, Adams, and Jefferson. Something to keep in mind, political parties didn't exist uh, during that first presidency, right? We talked about this with the ratification of the Constitution. Uh, Federalists and anti-Federalists in terms of the ratification of the Constitution, we're not a party. Um, so George Washington is not associated with any political party. Um, you'll often hear uh, people cite Washington as being opposed to political parties, um, and that comes from his farewell address. Um, but Washington was president 1789 to 1797. Um, and he sets many of the precedents, right? So when we looked at the Constitution, the Constitution says that the executive is defined as the president, the vice president, and other uh, executive uh, council, right? Um, however he sees fit. And so Washington sets that up as the cabinet, and that becomes a, um, that becomes a pattern, Presidents after him established these advisors. And so um, a lot of these terms even that we use to describe them come from Washington's presidency. This idea of that these advisors are called the cabinet. Um, this idea of term limits, right? Washington voluntarily steps, steps down after two terms. We won't codify this in law until after FDR, um, who I lovingly call King FDR, but we'll get to that later. Um, we won't put it in law until then, but Every president after Washington up to Franklin Roosevelt uh, will serve a maximum of two terms, and then they walk away, and that's on George Washington's uh, precedent. Okay. Um, now, something to keep in mind is George Washington immediately adopts a policy of neutrality for foreign policy. So the United States in its infancy um, is going to be very isolationist, very uh, hands-off in foreign conflict, and this is this sets him at conflict with uh, Thomas Jefferson um, and others aligned with Jefferson early on, um, particularly around the French Revolution, which you should have studied in world history. Uh, with John Adams, John Adams would be the first that we would, we would say has a, a political party. He was a Federalist. He served from 1797 to 1801. He was the first vice president, right? So he was vice president to George Washington. And uh, when he became president, it was quite controversial, but uh, as president, he avoids a war with France, keeps us out of, out of that, um, but he also is the president under which the Alien and Sedition Acts are signed, and that's key, make yourself a note, um, that's going to lead to this crisis that we refer to as nullification. Uh, the Alien and Sedition Acts are going to be the, the tool that southern states um, and particularly states later on under uh, Jackson's presidency, are going to use uh, to basically say that they can nullify portions or pieces of the Constitution, that they retain their uh, states' rights to nullify those things. Thomas Jefferson is our third president. Again, another controversial figure, something to keep in mind, um, you know, we are a, a nation run by human beings, right? And so none of these people are perfect. We're not saying that because they're president, all of a sudden they're perfect human beings. We have to take the good and the bad, and we have to look at them honestly. And so with Jefferson, um, Jefferson gives us a lot of um, 
presidential powers, this idea that he, he is going to try and push the button uh, and push the boundary of presidential powers. Now the court is going to step in and the court is going to stop him in quite a few areas. Um, and it's because of Jefferson's presidency. It's because of Supreme Court cases like Marbury versus Madison that we end up with this idea of judicial review and our court, our Supreme Court is strengthened uh, as a result of Jefferson pushing these boundaries, right? Uh, Jefferson is responsible for a lot of our uh, national <laughs> westward expansion. He, he purchases the Louisiana Territory for $15 million and I'll show you a map in a moment. Um, but Jefferson Jefferson has an eye toward the people. Jefferson, uh, we would say, is a Democratic Republican, right? And this idea of a Jeffersonian Republican uh, is somebody who is in favor of small government, right? So this is the roots of our modern uh, Republican Party, our modern GOP. Um, now, bear with me as we go through this. You will see that, that the titles and, and, and how those are associated change over time. Um, so when I say Republicans in a few slides, um, that is not the same thing as today's modern GOP, and I'll keep reminding you of that, but Thomas Jefferson's philosophy of government, this idea of a small central government, uh, stronger state governments, right? That in that balance of federalism, Jefferson would say that the states have more power. Uh, that would have been his ideal. Um, and that's, again, those are the roots of our modern uh, Republican party. So here you go, here's a map. This is the United States before the Louisiana Purchase, right? So again, those are those. There's those 13 colonies plus the few states that have joined since then, right? There's this territory that we haven't done anything with, and then you'll see this colony of Louisiana, which the French still owned. Um, he is going to purchase that. Napoleon is hemorrhaging cash in France, and Napoleon needs out of these responsibilities, and so Napoleon is going to sell the United States, the Louisiana Territory, for 15 million dollars. Um, now. Jefferson didn't really have the authority to do this, right? The Constitution isn't super clear on the purchasing of land from another nation. Congress interpreted that as something they had to do because it had to do with money. It had, you know, the origination of any bill or anything having to do with money has to originate in the House of Representatives. We read that in the Constitution. So Congress isn't super clear on whether or not Jefferson's actually allowed to do this, but Jefferson does it. And Today, we, we have this territory. This is part of our country. Um, and again, that's what a major theme throughout these early presidents is, is really where is the boundary of power? Where, where do these separation of powers, uh, where are the limits on them and where do they exist? And so, again, it's going to be a constant push and pull of do we have the power? Do, does he have the power? Um, but nevertheless, we end up with this Louisiana territory um, and Jefferson is responsible for that. Moving on, we have Madison. Uh, again, Madison, a major player in the founding of the nation. Uh, Madison is credited with compiling the Bill of Rights, um, and he be, he is our uh, he's our fourth president. Okay, president from 1809 to 1817. Uh, something critical under his presidency is the War of 1812. It is our first. Uh, international war uh, as a nation um, at, since the revolution, right? And it's basically the Revolutionary War Part Two. Um, and under the War of 1812, the end, the end result is this, that the, the Federalist Party is no more, uh, manufacturing goes on the rise, um, the U.S. is firmly free. We win this war, again, it's basically the Revolutionary War Part Two, and, uh, and we win. And out of this war, we see the rise of this war hero, Andrew Jackson, at the Battle of New Orleans. Uh, he is not going to go away, and we will see him in a little bit. That takes us to James Monroe, our fifth president. Again, uh, a Democratic Republican uh, from 1817 to 1825. Um, and under Monroe, we see the rise of nationalism, this idea of the Monroe Doctrine, right? That not only uh, were we going to control the land that we had, um, but we were going to say to Europe um, that the Western Hemisphere was ours, that they could no longer colonize in places like Latin America, the Caribbean, 
uh, South America, that the Western Hemisphere was ours, and that if they invaded those waters, if they came this way, under the Monroe Doctrine, we were going to stop them. We weren't going to, to fight to end any pre-existing colonies. We were just going to stop the formation of any new ones. Uh, under, the, under James Monroe, we also see the Missouri Compromise, and this is a huge step, again, in this walk towards civil war. The Missouri Compromise um, is a major piece of this. Uh, it allows Maine to enter the Union as a free state. Missouri comes in as a slave state, and it establishes what is known as the Mason-Dixon Line. Um, this is where we get this idea that north of the Mason-Dixon Line, uh, any, any new states uh, will have to enter the Union as free states. South of the Mason-Dixon line, any new states added to the Union will have to come in as slave states. This is going to be a major piece uh, in the battle between northern and southern states for control. Remember, the issue is not just slavery. It's also population, right? We, it's, it's about representation, right? So it's slavery as an institution, but it's also slavery in terms of what it means and what it represents for uh, representation in Congress. Okay, and that brings us to John Quincy Adams. John Quincy Adams is the first president we would label as a Republican. Um, but again, this is not a Republican in terms of what it means today. Um, he is president from 18, 1825 to 1829. Under Adams, many of the states relaxed their property requirements for voting, uh, expanding the voting population, expanding who gets to vote. This is not a... Uh, an idea that would have been popular with um, a lot of people. Again, this idea of who has power, right? The, the, the vote is power. And so if you take away uh, the requirement for property, that means that these poorer landless men are now getting to vote. And so your wealthy landowners are not going to be very happy about this. In fact, it ends up splitting the Democratic-Republican Party of the time. And it ends up leading to the election of Andrew Jackson. The parties are split. Jackson is this war hero, this Democrat, and he comes in uh, and he, he takes the election from 1829 to 1837. And we get this new idea of a Jacksonian democracy, right? We had a, a Jeffersonian republic, and now we have a Jacksonian democracy, right? It's this idea that the common man uh, gets to run and gets to be a part of government. Andrew Jackson uh, f fancied himself this man of the people, this man that represented the common, poor, working, uh, rural American. Um, and this was very counter to the uh, East Coast elite, northern elite of uh, what would have been considered the Republican Party. This is a very common argument that we see throughout history. It's, it, it repeats itself. We constantly have this push and pull of the common man versus the elite, right? We saw this in 2016 in our own election, in our most recent elections, right? This idea of the entrenched Washington politician versus the outsider. Um, and again, we saw that this, this, pattern in history that when we when we get this person who appeals to the common man, uh, they tend to get elected. Now, Jackson had a, a, many issues in, under his presidency, uh, not least of which were his, the, the way that he gave out uh, positions in his government. It was people who were his friends. It wasn't people that were necessarily qualified uh, to, be, to be in these roles, but he gave it to them because to, to the victor goes the spoils was really his mentality. And if you supported him and he won, guess what? You were part of the winning team. You got a job. Um, it didn't matter if you had no experience in that field. It didn't matter if you weren't qualified. You were on his team. Therefore, he was going to take care of you. Um, and what we end up seeing is this leads to a lot of policies that hurt the union. Uh, number one being the Indian Removal Act of 1830. Right, Jackson is the one who takes the step to remove Native Americans. We end up with the Trail of Tears, uh, which you should have covered in eighth grade. But this mass removal of Native Americans from their tribal lands, uh, this confiscation of their lands, and moving them into these uninhabited territories in the West, land that nobody wanted, um, and, and just really pushing them out, right? 
We also see, again, this idea of the nullification crisis. John C. Calhoun, who we will see uh, in later lectures as well, they rise up, and these, some of these ideas that, that Jackson's putting out there, they come up and say, no, we don't have to do it, right? That these states, under this federal system of government, the states retain certain rights, and we do not have to comply with this. We can nullify portions of the Constitution. Um, that comes up under Jackson's presidency. Um, and really, what it ends up leaving is for Martin Van Buren, who comes next, it leaves an economic crisis. Uh, Andrew Jackson leaves a country um, that is socially divided. He leaves a country that is economically uh, in, in crisis. And you end up with the Panic of 1837, which is one of our first uh, recessions in this country, first major recessions. Um, and this weak economy is likely what costs Van Buren re-election um, and gives rise to this new Whig party, right? The country blames this Democratic Party of Jackson and Van Buren. They blame them for the downturn in the economy. They blame them for the civil unrest. And so William Henry Harrison, um, another war hero, is elected in 1841. He dies one month after being elected. And John Tyler becomes president. Now, John Tyler is the one that takes politics in this country, and it becomes more about passions. It becomes more about uh, your what you like. It becomes more about uh, the flash than the substance of the issue. Um, he is the one who will <laughs> very much argue that our country um, needs to go west, right? Again, John Tyler is a war hero. He fought in the War of 1812. Um, he is a firm believer in this idea that God has predestined America to inhabit the entire continent, that we are not meant to just stay on that east coast in those former colonies, that it is our land for the taking. And he pushes this idea of manifest destiny, that we are going to take the nation. James Polk comes after him in 1845, um, and under Polk, Texas joins the Union. Um, if we had time, I would talk about, <laughs> I would go into great detail about Texas and the issues with Texas and the way that we uh, stole Texas from Mexico. We don't have time with that. Suffice it to say that under Polk, uh, because of this uh, annexation of Texas, because Texas joins the Union, uh, we end up at war with Mexico. It is not a fair fight. It is a, a fight that we baited Mexico in to, and that in the end, we end up taking 50% of Mexico's land mass away from them in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. This includes California. This includes the territory that in the state that we now live in, California, um, which was originally taken by a group of people who walked into Mexico established a uh, a little a little colony, if you will, a little town. Uh, they'd labeled themselves the Bear Flag Republic. They said that this is their land. Uh, they were claiming it from Mexico, right? They were in foreign invaders into Mexican national lands, said it was theirs. Uh, and again, this is the United States attempted baiting Mexico into war. Mexico takes the bait, loses the war, and loses California. Um, our flag today, this idea that we have the, the, the bear on our flag, um, it is a symbol of foreign invasion. There's no way around it. That's, that's how we got this land. Um, so that all ha happens under James Polk. Polk is also president when the California gold rush begins. And again, this, this continued wave of westward movement, western, uh, westward migration, right? These poor landless uh, men running to the West to try and strike it rich, right? This idea that gold was just waiting for them. Um, and we know it wasn't true. We know that many of them died. We know that uh, in these in these gold rush towns, right, we know that um, immigrants were taken advantage of. But we also know that this is a, a moment in history where um, our Chinese immigrants are allowed to set up towns of their own, where we first see the rise of what we would today uh, see in major urban centers as, as Chinatowns, right? These idea that, this idea that they had their own ethnic enclave to themselves. Um, now, again, this is the quick and fast version, so we don't have time to get into all the ways that those ethnic enclaves were um, actually 
just forced on them and that they were not great places to actually live. Um, but suffice it to say that at this time under Polk, right, we see this westward expansion. Uh, we see this territorial taking from Mexico. We see uh, the rise of ethnic enclaves in the west. And it really sets up uh, what is about to come next over the next decade, right? Zachary Taylor, another war, uh, war veteran, will take uh, office in 1849. Um, again, this he's he is uh, he he earns the nickname Old Rough and Ready during the war with Mexico. Uh, he um, is vehemently opposed to the Mexican government. He is in total favor of the fact that we we took land from them. He is very happy about that. He's very proud of that legacy and his legacy in that war. Um, and he will be president when California is seeking admission to the Union. And California breaks the rules. The Mason-Dixon line cuts California nearly in half. And so the issue becomes, will California be free or will it be slave? Uh, and Zachary Taylor uh, dies in July of 1850, dies of a stomach disease, passes the buck um, to the next president. As you'll see, here's a just a quick map video, right? This is, this is the expansion of the country. This is where we're at, okay? So as you can see, again, following this timeline, Zachary Taylor is going to die in 1850. And so as we approach 1850, you can see this is what it looks like. Right, there's Texas. Now here's this Mexican session. That's the land we take from Mexico. There's California. And we're gonna see in a moment how the rest of that land comes out. So Millard Fillmore takes over. Millard, Millard Fillmore is president when we get the Compromise of 1850. This compromise brings California into the Union as a free state. Uh, it establishes a new, more effective fugitive slave law. So if, if slaves uh, run away, it it firms up this idea that that uh, states and people who who find these runaways are forced to give them back. Um, and what it allows, this is where the compromise piece comes in. California comes in free, but it allows New Mexico and Utah to come into the Union as states, and they get to decide whether they will be slave or free. The Mason-Dixon line is no more. This idea of popular sovereignty, the people in that state will vote, um, and that is how it will be decided whether they come in free or slave. Franklin Pierce comes next. Uh, the major thing under Franklin Pierce is, again, this idea, th this Kansas-Nebraska Act. Again, this is having to do with the issue of uh, balancing the slave and free states. Uh, again, the Mason-Dixon line of the Missouri Compromise is dead, and so now every time a new state wants to join, it becomes an issue of will they be free, will they be slave? Um, and Kansas, the Kansas-Nebraska Act uh, firms that up. It allows uh, Kansas and Nebraska both to come in to the Union. And what we end up seeing is this pushback, right? Franklin Pierce is a Democrat, um, and we see this rise of these new Republicans, these new Republicans that are free soilers, which means that they um, are uh, a mix, right? Free soilers don't like slavery, but they don't like slavery because it takes jobs away from poor white people. They are not morally opposed to slavery. They have no issue with enslaving, enslaving African Americans or Africans. Um, they simply think it takes jobs away from poor white people. So that's why they're opposed to slavery. Um, the New Republicans also contain anti-slavery Whigs and Democrats, right? Uh, member People who had aligned with those parties but had now become anti-slavery for whatever reason, whether it was moral conviction or, again, whether they were uh, now more so aligning themselves with this free soil doctrine. Um, and then the New Republicans also consi consist of nativists. And nativists are people who only uh, favor those people born here uh, in the United States. So they are opposed to immigrants. They are anti-immigrant. They are anti. Uh, they are anti-slavery not because they don't think slavery is okay. They are anti-slavery because they argue that those people weren't born here. They were brought here. Um, and again, it's it's a very elitist uh, and very protectionist new party. 
but this is the this is the new party that rises. It comes under the name of Republicans. We've seen this party this name before, uh, but this is a new Republican party. James Buchanan is going to is going to get elected in 1856, take office in 1857, um, and he is again he's a Democrat. In 1857, he is president when the Dred Scott decision is made. Uh, which again we've we've talked about, and hopefully you've talked about in eighth grade. Um, in 1858, uh, you have the Lincoln-Douglas debates that begin happening, and Buchanan is uh, concerned. Buchanan uh, starts to see the country falling apart. Right, October 1859, we have John Brown's raid, which is a uh, multi-ethnic effort, a two-year planned effort to overthrow the government. Um, it's squashed, but James Buchanan then just sits back and watches as the country tears itself apart. Uh, James Buchanan is unequivocally listed uh, on every major presidential ranking. James Buchanan is consistently the worst ranked president of our of our history um, because again he sat back and watched as the Union tore itself apart over this issue of slavery, and he did nothing. So that, again, that is a very quick snapshot. Um, that is everything you should have covered in eighth grade in like the Reader's Digest version on steroids. So hopefully you tracked with that again. Um, we are going to pick this up in our next lecture. We're going to look at uh, part two, 1860, 1865, the actual Civil War. But uh, that is it for now. Don't forget to add a five-sentence summary to your notes. And I will talk to you soon.